Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm super excited for our guest today. We've got Jeff Rothschild on the show to talk all things fasting. Jeff's a registered dietitian with a master's degree in nutritional science and a board-certified specialist in sports dietetics. He works with a variety of people, including collegiate and professional tennis players, triathletes, cyclists, boxers, and a number of touring musicians at TriFit in Santa Monica, California, and also teaches college sports nutrition at CSU in LA. Jeff, welcome. Thanks. Appreciate having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for joining us. So before we uh, dig into our topic around fasting, can you just tell folks a little bit about how you got into all this health and fitness stuff? Uh, Yeah. I mean, it started out, like most people's, as an interest in kind of learning more and, and just making yourself feel better and then enjoyed the, the process of learning and growing and, and, you know, continuing to expand what I knew and, and, uh, explore. So I just, the next logical step at one point was to do, uh, or go back to school and do my master's degree in nutritional science and became a registered dietitian. And, and I really enjoyed working with people and sharing, um, what I've been learning and translating what I've been learning on the science side. And so I work, spend most of my time now in a private practice setting. That's great, man. So as far as fasting goes, can you give us just kind of a little bit of the history around fasting from an evolutionary perspective? Yeah. So if we go way back, we can, it's pretty safe assumption that it was normal that there was periods of feasting and famine. So our bodies had to deal with that or we wouldn't be here. So we have a lot of, um, pretty amazing like backup systems and mechanisms to deal with food shortages and at the same time we have these systems to deal with food surplus in that we can store it as fat so we became say good at storing fat when we had food and good at burning fat when we didn't what's interesting though is as we fast forward and and the agricultural revolution came and, and there's relatively stable food supply we see that pretty much every major religion keeps some type of fasting. So you could argue that it's for spiritual practices, but it's certainly also they probably onto the health benefits. So I'd be hard pressed to find a religion that doesn't include some sort of fasting. Um, just to give a few examples, um, in Islam, the, the, there's the month of Ramadan. So the people only eat, only eat and drink when the sun is set. So that can be pretty mild in the winter. Um, but pretty, you know, so, so quite a lot of fasting if it falls in the summertime. Right. Um, we can look at the Greek Orthodox religion, which had 180 to 200 days per year of some type of dietary restriction. So that's not always complete fasting, but um, the, the the rules there they're pretty. Um, what's the word? Uh, I mean, like no olive oil, meat, and eggs on Wednesday and Saturday, or like they're pretty nuanced. Um, right. But these people. Uh, that followed originally the Mediterranean diet, a lot of them were Greek Orthodox, or they were generally Greek Orthodox religion. So while most people are familiar with the Mediterranean diet as being one of the most healthy you know, dietary patterns, uh, a large part of the original Mediterranean diet included a lot of fasting. And Judea, Judaism, uh, you know, Mormonism, all, all, they all have some type of different fasting. Yeah, that's great. So basically, this is, uh, this is nothing new. It's been around for, for ages. Exactly, yeah. Very cool. So what are some of the kind of kickbacks, fears, maybe common myths that you hear most around fasting? Yeah, there's, there's a few that come up. Uh, one would be you're just going to overeat at the next meal. So when when I, when I hear that, or I I usually just kind of preemptively address it when I'm talking with clients about it, there's a difference between skipping a meal and delaying a meal. So if you normally eat lunch at noon and you wait till 2 PM, yeah, you're probably going to eat more and a lot more. Um, at the same time, if you normally eat lunch at noon and you dinner at six and you skip lunch and wait till six o'clock and eat dinner, you, you might eat a little bit more, but you're probably not going to eat double. And so that, I, I, that holds true for if you're skipping a meal or if you're skipping a day, um, you, you will eat a little bit more at the next meal, but definitely does not double or even make up for completely what you skipped. Another one is that burning muscle, um, metabolism slowing down, not being able to think all these ones come up and there's you know, none of them are that valid in my mind. So as far as your metabolism slowing down, actually it speeds up. It doesn't slow down until, uh, I think it's about 60 hours of fasting. So initially it speeds up, which it makes sense because it's actually a, a bit of an increased stressor on your body. So there is, it's a, it's a stress response and maybe we'll come back later and talk about who it's not good for, but people under high stress situations, that wouldn't be a good thing to add to that stress bucket. Um, but 
doesn't again slow down your metabolism and actually also over time it probably preserves your metabolism during while dieting better than uh, a, a traditional diet where you're restricting calories every day um, again muscle mass the same thing um, it, it's not till around say 60 hours or so where, where the, the, these things really start um, these let's say more negative effects start happening very cool. So uh, that, as far as that minor stress response kicking up metabolism, that just makes me think of hormesis. So can you touch on that just really briefly? Yeah, the concept of hormesis, which is you know a little bit of a stressor, um, a, a, something that would be bad in large amounts is good in small amounts. So something like exercise, yeah, um, that's that's going on, and it's it's really um, your body's under stress so it has to keep your glucose levels up and it has to keep your basically yourself functioning if we um couldn't function when there wasn't food around again we wouldn't be here so that's another kind of myth is or another fear is you know uh if i'm fasting i'm just gonna like have to sit there and not not do anything and be inert all day no i mean if again if that if that happened um it, it just we wouldn't we couldn't be here so your body is able to think clearly I mean, again, you're not, you, know, you can't just, you're not just brain dead and, and weak. If you're, if there's no food around, um, you have to be actually sharper and perhaps more energetic. And that, that happens in part due to that stress response. So, um, also the reason to maybe not do it every day of your life. Um, but you know, in, in, um, in intermittently. Right. But, very cool. So, um, in other words, like some of the kickback that I get and I hear is people will say like, I get hangry, I get irritated, I get uh, sort of short-tempered and all that sort of stuff if they don't have their meal at a certain amount of time or if they skip one or they just extend that window. So um, can, can you touch on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I can, you know, I, I see that too and I hear that. Um, I think a few things are going on there. One, there's a there's a, um, a, a timing or you're used to, you're accustomed to eating at a certain time and it's mental. And so there's, there was one interesting study. It's, it's hard to do placebo controlled fasting studies, obviously, but in one study, I, I remember, um, people had a drink, like basically there was no social aspect. So they had to go basically into a closet and drink a drink for their calories. So there was no taste, no, no, you know, no, otherwise the social rewards. And, um, it was just, just simply you, you drink your calories and that's it. But when, so that, that's a way for people to not know how many calories they're getting. Right. And they're just, kind of and when people don't know those declines in in you know mental function all these things you don't see them as much people the, the decline in cognitive function so when you can truly blind the fasting which again is, is challenging and in real life you, you can't really do it but um you see that it is there's a lot of a mental side of it so it's not not so physical also it seems um in practice that once there's that um, our bodies, hunger hormones are, are timed, you know, so we're used to eating at noon every day or whatever. Once you break through that little meal window, it seems to be much easier for people uh, anecdotally. Like, so if you, once you get through your lunch hour, have some water or something, then, you know, you're, you're good for a few more hours. So it kind of comes in waves. Um, right. So that's a way to kind of, to help that. Yeah, that's great. And I love that analogy of hunger coming in waves because it's like, okay, if I push through this wave, I'm going to be good for a yep. little bit. And it's not like a permanent thing that I just have to sit through. Exactly right. Unless you're doing like a long term fast or, you know, three, four, five day fast, and then you're just kind of constantly hungry all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, now, now that we covered some of the, the myths and kind of knocked those out, what are the potential upsides of fasting? So, what benefits can people yield? Yeah, this is, um, it, it's, I guess a bit of a contentious topic. Some people are going to say it's just the calorie reduction. I, I really don't believe that it's just the calorie reduction because we see different differential effects when someone is, uh, let's just see dieting a traditional diet where you're just restricting a little bit each day versus, um, the timing, whether you're having a longer overnight eating, uh, overnight fasting window or whether you're doing uh, alternate day fasting, whatever the, the, the approach is. And we can talk about the different approaches, but there are some, some, in some ways, differential effects between them. So, um, one, it, it is a, I think the, the biggest thing for people is it's an easier way to reduce calories. Um, whether it's worrying about your timing. So if you're eating in a 10 hour window through the day, that's what you have to focus on or eight hour, whatever the window is. Um, it, it takes the calorie counting out of it. I mean, calorie counting, as I'm sure you know, and, and anyone listening is it's hard, like estimating unless you're weighing and measuring. So, it, you know, if, if someone has food scales, but that it's going to drive you crazy in its own way to look at a plate of pasta and know how much, how many, how many cups is that? I mean, it's, it's so hard to do. 
half a cup and a cup. And when you look at the two of them together, I mean, that most people couldn't, you know, know the difference. So, so it takes away that whole aspect of just worrying about, okay, I'm eating within these, uh, you know, within this window. Or another approach that I'll use is that 5-2 approach where it's basically 500 calories or about 25% of someone's usual needs, so 450 to 500 or so calories two days per week on two non-consecutive days. When you're only counting to 450 or 500 calories, it's actually pretty easy because you might be like uh, a hard-boiled egg or two, a cup of spinach, uh, some, a Greek yogurt, um, a half a chicken breast, you know, whatever it is. It's actually it's, it's much more manageable when it's a small amount of food to, to stay pretty accurate. It's only when you start getting into these bigger dishes that, and, and that have mixed amounts of foods that it becomes more challenging. So one of the benefits there to reduce calories is it's, yeah, it's, it's manageable in, in, in a more accurate way, I would say. So beyond the calorie reduction, which comes with a whole lot of benefits, there's potentially benefits uh, in the body clock and setting a strong body clock, presuming you're eating them at the right time. So we can should probably talk about that. Um, there is, you know, potentially glucose lowering effects, cholesterol lowering effects. I mean, it, it's there's kind of um, you can find some research that touches on almost every area of metabolic health that there is some benefit. And so um, the challenge is one: a lot of research right now is in animals and not humans. But also, there's these different fasting methods. There's whether you do exercise or not. So there's there's so many variables, but. I would say all in all, it's at least as good as, say, traditional dieting in most every category and potentially better. Like I said, also, um, uh, I could think of at least one or two studies where metabolic rate is probably preserved better while dieting. So, for example, if some, a, a traditional diet, let's say, is if someone needs 2,000 calories you know, for their baseline uh, for weight maintenance, a traditional diet might have them eat 1,600 calories every day. Or you could do 2,000 calories most of the time and then 500 calories two days per week. It's going to work out to basically the same at the end of the week. So your weight loss should be similar, but if you think about the, um, the body's adaptive response, um, when there's a constant, consistent reduction, your body kind of, I don't like the term, get, gets used to it, but there is it, it can expect, like, okay, this is what we're getting. Whereas when you're having 2,000 calories, your, your weight maintenance needs most days, your body is not in that type of is not um, under that type of stress. And then it, one day you, you go drastically lower, but then the next day you're right back up to your, your maintenance level. So it's your body doesn't adapt from that one day of, of, of shortage, let's say. So it's kind of letting your body rest easier, so to speak. But then every once in a while, so every several days, you're going to kind of pull the rug out. And that seems to be um, a better way to, to preserve metabolic rate. Awesome, man. Yeah, we're going to touch on some of the uh, specific ways that people can can implement some of this stuff as far as their lifestyle goes. I just wanted to touch on digestion issues. I've had a lot of success with people just um, maybe just extending that window and not having a constant input of food. Um, obviously, improving the quality and improving or actually cutting out foods that they find they're sensitive to helps, but also just you know giving the body a break from digestion in itself. Have you seen that? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I haven't um, probably. I guess I haven't thought about it a whole lot, but yeah. I mean, it, I, of course, it makes sense. Um, how how long? Um, what type of overnight window do you need to? Do you feel like is a minimum for you to see some of these benefits? It kind of varies. I mean, I'd say a minimum of twelve, um, yeah. and then anything up from there just seems to kind of improve things. And um, depending on the person's tolerance and things like that, of how long they can go without food. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's I think that's a good general rule. That's kind of what I personally try to follow is a minimum of twelve hours overnight. Um, sometimes it's it's challenging, but generally, like that's what I'll, I'll try to get most people that I'm working with that are trying to either get healthier or lose weight to say a, a minimum of twelve. Um, it, it's that's a challenging thing because it depends on you know family schedules and people. I, I want people to eat breakfast, but if they want to go home and eat with their family, then there's there might be a rub there, but. Um, Trying to, to find that compromise of at least twelve hours of, of, of uh, overnight fasting, I think, is a, a sound sound idea. Yeah, that's great. And then, how about um, from just uh, can you touch on auto autophagy and and how that process works when fasting and how it's extended? Yeah, so I think of it like um, if you had if you were at a buffet, like a Las Vegas buffet, you would take a plate of food, 
and you would go through the buffet and you eat probably most of the plate, but then you'd probably leave a whole bunch of food on the plate and then go back for another plate and then eat a whole bunch of more food and probably leave by the end of the, of your meal, there's probably three or four plates of food that are like, have a whole bunch of stuff on it. In contrast, if you ate, if you had one plate of food and you just had to finish that and you didn't get any more, you'd probably eat up every crumb. So I, that's how I kind of think of it. Whereas that extended window overnight and, and it actually increases with the fasting duration, your body is able to clean up all those spare, spare, like spare pieces of food, so to speak, or, or it's like if you had a dog under the kitchen table eating up all the little pieces. So, um, your body can, can autophagy or autophagy. I haven't still figured out how, what the, yeah, neither have I. I was it, just thinking about that. I've heard it pronounced both ways. So. I think it should be autophagy cause it's auto like automobile. But, um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's, it's your body's way of kind of like cleaning up all the spare bits, the little amino acids or the different proteins, th- things that, that can kind of, um, yeah, it's like the, the dog under the kitchen table, just cleaning up all the spare bits. Yeah. So that's just kind of thing for our body. Our so it recycles the, the, the old cells or the things that maybe are, are not as, as strong. And, and so, um, uh, it's, it's given more extended duration. We can kind of start to think of it like a oil change where if you're fasting for five days, that cleanup process where the, the weaker and the, the less healthy cells get recycled and eaten, um, and then rebuilt. So it, it happens on a small scale overnight, but as the, um, window gets larger to, let's say up to a 24 hour fast, that, that process gets dramatically upregulated. Awesome. That's great, man. So I personally choose to skip breakfast because also, well, I'm used to it. And then I eat dinner with my girlfriend and that just works as far as my lifestyle goes and my personal preferences. But um, there are way more ways to implement fasting into someone's lifestyle if they like to eat breakfast. And I know you're a fan of getting food in, you know, when it's daylight hours and, and that yeah. sort of thing. So can you just touch on kind of random meal skipping, maybe the five, two approach, limiting your eating window, you can skip an entire mm-hmm. day or, or maybe just limiting food options. Yeah, sure. So yeah, you said there's, there's a lot of different ways to implement some, I mean, if we take a step back, I would, let's call fasting purposely skipping some type of food you would normally eat. So, um, yeah, there's different ways and there's, there's probably different benefits that to, to your other question, like what are the benefits? Well, it depends on the, the approach that you implement. So, um, the, the, the kind of the most common ones are probably eating in a limited eating window. So in animal studies, it's called time restricted feeding and I guess humans, it should be called time restricted eating. But anyway, it's, it's taking, compressing the window within which you eat your food. Um, we just talked about having like a 12 hour overnight fasting window, which of course leaves a 12 hour eating window. Um, some people will, will crunch that eating window down to about eight hours. Um, which sounds like what you do. Um, and, and I guess as an aside, that's one of my pet peeves is that some people assume inter- intermittent fasting means just eating from 12 to eight. And maybe in some, um, areas that, that's the word I, I consider intermittent fasting, this whole type of purposely skipping this, this, these eating occasions. So anyway, a limited eating window is, is a type of intermittent fasting. Um, I prefer an earlier eight to 10 hour window if someone's going to do that. So for me personally, I, I might get close to there, maybe a, a, a nine hour window. Um, but I think from 7 AM to three or 4 PM is going to be better or eight to four, eight to five, somewhere in there, especially cause we're in winter now. And, uh, I'm sure it gets darker even earlier where you are than, than where I am, but it gets dark pretty darn early. The reason I say this is important. So in the summertime, you can be a little bit more cavalier with it, but mel- there's melatonin. So take a step back when, when the sun goes down, melatonin comes up as long as we're not staring at screens and things like that. So when melatonin comes up, that's like our nighttime hormone. People think of it as like a sleepy hormone. It's not, it's really the darkness hormone. There's melatonin receptors on our pancreas. And, and our insulin secretion is um, impaired. Our insulin, you know, we're, we're, the insulin doesn't work as well at night. And the body knows it's night because melatonin is up. So that means the same meal consumed at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m., the, the blood glucose response will be perhaps double or more at 8 p.m. than it was at 8 a.m. So that means your body doesn't process the same food. Now, if you're other, otherwise healthy and all these things, you certainly are, um, you know, you, we can get away with it. We, our body is amazingly flexible. Um, but for most people, I think it's, you, you want to set yourself up to handle meals the best and, and, and have the best glucose response, things like that. So that's why I prefer those earlier windows in the winter, particularly because it's getting dark at five o'clock now. 
So regardless, though, simply limiting the eating window is, is a good idea because even during Ramadan, we see generally health improvements, and they're eating only when the sun is set. So that's effectively completely opposite. So they see improvements despite the fact that they're eating at the completely wrong time. Um, I think that's also why we see um, kind of sometimes that there's no real changes in their health outcomes, but sometimes there's improvements. I think it, it kind of depends on the time of year and things like that. So anyway, you could take an 8 to 12-hour eating window, and, and that's going to be a good thing for most people. Also, you could skip a whole day. You can just eat one day and not eat the next day. That's a, a bit uh, kind of hardcore, but I actually have found some people do really well with that. Um, it takes the right kind of person, though, and, and usually someone who has got a lot of weight to lose. The most common thing that I do with people is, is this 5-2 approach. So basically about 25% of your needs on two non-consecutive days. So as I said before, it, it, you can eat maintenance five days out of the week, and then two days you're just taking this drastic reduction, and that allows at the end of the week an equivalent reduction in calories than if you reduced by about 20% each day. So that's surprisingly doable for people. Um, it's, it's, it's not that common in, in the U.S. at least, but in, in Britain there was a book, I think, and it, it's actually quite common. But uh, it's, yeah, most people are like sound a little freaked out or they're a little freaked out when they first hear it, but it, it actually works quite well. Um, for most people, um, the difference in men and women I notice is women tend to prefer three or four of these small meals spread through the day where men would rather, you should just skip from dinner to dinner and, and call it about 500 calories or so. And, um, so that's an, another common approach. Those are the, the two most common things I do, I do. But as we mentioned, the Greek Orthodox religion, you could limit your food, uh, options. So you could do like vegan Mondays or whatever. Um, now of course, vegan Mondays could not be, you know, could be high calorie, but it's a way to go lower in, in protein, uh, which is actually a good thing sometimes. Um, lower in calories, usually lower in carbohydrates. So um, that is an option. Um, probably something like that, you know, you, you're not going to see a, a big change in like one week or something like you would with some more drastic forms of fasting or in a couple weeks. But over time, it's probably a good idea to just deprive your body of, of protein every once in a while, presuming you're getting sufficient calories of protein the rest of the days. Now, another option is once in a while doing a really long fast, like three or four days water fast or set some people to a seven-day water fast. That's, um, I, I, I couldn't, I don't think I would enjoy that very much. <laughs> um, but there's Yet one other option related is, is something called a fasting mimicking diet. So uh, Dr. Walter Longo at USC, he studies longevity, and, and they created this diet that effectively mimics the effects of fasting for, it's a five-day, it's a basically boxed food, five days you get each day one, day two, day three, or 45, and it's low calorie, low carbohydrate, low protein, but fairly high in satiety and high in nutrients. So it's, the best way I describe it is highly tolerable. Um, have you had a chance to try it? I haven't had a chance to try it, but I'm a fan of Walter Longo and I like his work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he does amazing research. And, and so something like that, there's, their research is really amazing what, what it's showing with, with this diet. And, and you take people that are otherwise quite unhealthy and, and you see some drastic changes. And, and so kind of like an oil, I think of it like an oil change for immune system because that autophagy that we talked about, like that's, that's getting upregulated. So there, there's some things that happen inside your body that, that don't happen in these daily fasts. So it takes about 36 hours or 40 hours to start kicking up other set of processes. So I think there is benefit. I'm probably due. I did one about a year ago and I probably do again for another. Um, just doing it once or twice a year, I think is a benefit because it's your immune system, the, the um, let's say your immune fingerprint or, or, or the, 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 you can look at your immune system as all these different types of immune cells and you can measure these, these counts and, and that, um, the profile really gets pretty drastically altered in a positive way um, when people do these. So I think there's a lot of benefit. Like I said, it's it's doable. I had um, a guy who was about 220 pounds. I've had a few guys in the 200 pounds do it. Um, and, you know, again, it's not fun, but they all say, yeah, it's, it's they got through it. It's much easier. But I guess the one downside to that is it's one it's kind of one size, and I think they'll gradually expand some, to some options. But a 100-pound woman doing it and a 200 20 pound guy doing it, you know, to getting the same amount of food. So obviously there's a much bigger reduction for the larger man. Um, but I think that is a, a really sound approach. So to kind of pull back, I think as general health, I think it's good to leave at least a minimum of 12 hours overnight. And if you want to kind of push that, um, as you, you know, as you can, then that's probably a good thing. If someone wants to play with the five, two diet, more likely, I think for weight loss, in my opinion, and then 
um, to the general health or weight, weight loss side doing these extended fasts uh, on occasion. I will uh, say, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And I was, yeah, and, and, and personally, like I said, I, I kind of stick to at least a minimum 12 hour window, but if I can eat the right meal around three or 4 PM, I, I'm kind of, I, I kind of enjoy, I don't do it all the time, but if I eat like a big Chipotle or something at like three or four, um, I can, and I know I can make it through to the evening, then I'll just, you know, that, that ends up being a pretty easy way to go till seven or 8 AM the next day. And you've got, uh, you know, 16, 17 hours without being really too tough. I mean, the hour or two before bed might, you might get a little peckish, but, um, you know, that, that's kind of how I implement just for a general health standpoint. Yeah, man, that's a great breakdown. So would it be safe to say that, uh, basically because we've evolved with, you know, food scarcity in a food scarcity situation that our physiology actually expects us to fast? Like you implement something once or twice a year, but w- that would probably be safe to say, right? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I guess it's a little conjecture, a bit of conjecture, but I, I think so. I mean, um, the, yeah, I mean, it's, we, it's weird that we don't, it's weird that we have 24 hours food availability all the time for our whole life. I mean, people that are 30, 40, 50 years old have never been hungry longer than a few hours for the most part. I mean, that's, that's weird. That's, that's really not right. And, um, you know, there's that thrifty gene hypothesis that came about in the sixties, um, that kind of tried to explain what they thought was a diabetes crisis back in the sixties, which has just gone up a crazy amount since then. But, yeah, I mean, the people that survived were good at storing fat when food was there, like I said before, and, and uh, good at burning it when, it when it wasn't. And so we're wired, and, and Stephen Gein, I'm sure, touched on, on this. You know, we're, we're wired to, to, you know, to, to survive and to store fat. And, and um, we, we just, we're, we're one side of the seesaw that we're not balancing out properly for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. So, are there any red flags that come up in your coaching practice with individuals where you specifically wouldn't implement fasting? Maybe, you know, certain health conditions or abnormal, a history of abnormal eating patterns or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. There's, there's a few, I can think of a few people that have wanted to do some type of fasting or come into my office and I've actually said no, um, that prolonged the, the fasting mimicking diet, this one woman, um, she's, I don't know, maybe 10 pounds overweight or something, but, and, and thought it was a good idea. But when she came in, she said, Oh, she was thinking about getting pregnant. Someone's pregnant obviously or thinking about getting pregnant i don't think it's a good idea if someone was going to get pregnant in six months then i think actually that could probably be a good idea but you don't want your body and and and, you know you're thinking there's this food scarcity um maybe six months is probably and this is again just really just a, a guess on my part of how much time i would leave before even trying to get pregnant but a minimum of six months i i think um or, or yeah somewhere around there i think there's a lot of good things again in reshaping your immune system so it will help someone get dialed in effectively before they're getting pregnant but i would keep it a distance from from when you're actually trying to get pregnant um i had um i saw a kid he's a a high school swimmer and he had been he'd read an article online and he was eating like two meals a day and his mom was like freaked out and didn't know if it was you know good or bad and or thought it was was freaked out so she came in and, and you know kind of explained again when you're so te- so adolescents should probably should not be doing this um you're growing you need especially if it's a high school swimmer someone who's burning a ton of calories it's harder enough so they're growing and uh working out a ton it's just not a good idea so basically pregnant people thinking about getting people think about getting pregnant people kids um uh when i was i, I do triathlon when i did uh was training for an Ironman, I basically threw out that, that eating window because it's just hard to get calories. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's already enough of stress in your body. Endurance sports are a big stress on your body. So hard training athletes in general, but endurance sports are kind of, they, when you look under the hood, there's a, a lot of the same benefits to fasting are what come from endurance sports. So this AMPK upregulation. So, um, but again, you're under a big stress with the training load, so there's no reason to, to let's say, expand your overnight fasting window. It's not like I would eat a, a giant meal before I went to sleep, but at the same time, I, I knew I needed to liberalize it, and just because you're always, you know, kind of hungry, or, or um, again, you just want to kind of de-stress your body. So, for anybody that is in that, um, maybe they're training for a triathlon, or you know, they're biking a bunch, or just their training load is quite high. Would you still push? the food into the daylight hours or would you let that spill over a little bit or how, how did you specifically, um, uh, yeah, if, if someone, um, kind of, again, depends on the time of year, I guess, because if someone has to exercise at 6 PM after work or something, 
um, and it's dark, well, they still want to eat after that. So it kind of depends. A lot of triathletes tend to exercise in the morning. So keeping their food yeah, around more around that workout is, is generally a good thing. Um, I, I'm not opposed to fasted endurance training if it's of the, at the right time and the right intensity. So that there is a component there. So it is, can play a role, but, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't push it quite as much with the daylight hours, things like that. Okay. Unless they're out early in the day, in, in which case probably is a good idea because they're probably uh, getting up early and going to sleep early and things like that. Cool. Yeah. And something I want to touch on just for people, um, if they're worried about, you know, especially this time of year, Hey, I, I just can't get all my food in, in daylight hours that, um, overall adherence and overall calorie intake matters more, um, than yeah. getting all that food in at a certain amount of time. But if you can manage it and you can, um, you want to optimize that much more pushing that back. And typically people sleep a lot better when they don't go to bed on a full stomach anyways, I've found. So, um, yeah. but again, adherence and calories in, in my opinion, I would say matter, matter more. Yeah. And, and even, um, if someone eats with their family at seven or o'clock at night or whatever, eat, most people eat a little bit of breakfast, a medium amount of lunch and a ton of dinner. And that should be flipped on its side. I, I think, I know again, you're skipping breakfast, but if, if there's, you know, for what I find is best practices, I mean, there, there's a lot of research that the, the people that eat their bigger meals early in the day is generally a good thing. So it's not that you have to stop eating at a certain time per se as much as you eat a, a lighter thing. So again, if someone, um, yeah, that, that, so I would push a bigger lunch, even whether, whether you're skipping breakfast or eating breakfast, um, so, and maybe an afternoon snack because a lot of people will eat lunch at, you know, between 12 and one and maybe not snack and then come home at eight or nine o'clock and eat just like a massive amount of food. And that is definitely not a good thing. So I might push a, an afternoon snack. Um, and then it's a lighter dinner and that even is a, is a good step. So again, it's not that you can't eat after dark, but it just, it's, it's harder. Your body's glucose, um, or the, the overall, you know, processing the meal, it's just a little bit more taxing, let's say. So without, blasting and you know a, a half of your calories at seven or eight o'clock at night um i think that's a sensible approach right yeah and i could see i think it's more of a societal thing than anything because you know we eat a big dinner with the fam and then we you know sit down on the couch watch some netflix and then start snacking so um yeah. it's it's tough like i think that for some folks maybe eating a bigger dinner might reduce their calorie load overall because their tendency is to snack late at night. But, um, I think that that's an awesome approach that you're talking about it, you know, maybe having a bigger, a bigger lunch, um, or even pushing your calories earlier in the day. Uh, so your, your body can tolerate it better. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's some good research. Um, Heather Lighty, I think she's at university of Missouri does a lot of protein breakfast studies, um, and ever had been and uh, a big protein breakfast, makes people less likely to snack even after dinner. So, you know, um, it's funny. Sometimes people will, that have these later eating issues, I start focusing on breakfast and they're kind of like confused. We're not reducing calories, but it's, it's a domino effect. So if you can get a, a large protein breakfast and there's actually some synergy with getting some sunshine on your body. So direct sunlight on your body after breakfast synergizes with some of the amino acids, um, specifically tryptophan to increase melatonin at night. So you eat a big protein breakfast and get direct sun on your body, your melatonin, at night is going to increase, believe it or not, and you're going to be less likely to snack. So there's this whole kind of just shifting of, of your body clock or, or I should say realignment of your body clock that, that happens. That's really cool, man. Yeah, and I'm hoping to dig into more of that circadian rhythm stuff with, with Dan Party when he's on the show, but that that's a huge that's a huge tip. That's awesome. So I know that Rhonda Patrick, she recommends not even consuming so or uh, coffee while fasting just to be safe. What are your thoughts on coffee does it matter what you put in there or something like bone broth for example yeah that's a good question um i think it depends i mean there's so many lenses or let's say outcomes we can measure from a given fast if, if we can like look at everything that's happening in our body like let's say after one day of a fast or something or if it's the calorie reduction that's that's key then yeah coffee it's not going to matter at all um if it's and actually, I, so, so if it's the, 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 the true fast, then yeah, coffee will break the fast because your liver has to process the coffee. So anything that besides water, anything, you're, anytime your liver has to work or do anything, that, that means it's turning on and it, it knows, okay, there's something coming in. You're still in the calorie reduction. But I actually think the coffees, if, if someone is going to follow that like skip breakfast meal, meal pattern, 
then coffee is probably a good thing because it starts the clock. So despite it, 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 it kind of like without people without realizing it, it's actually helping people because yeah, you're not getting any calories, but it does start your clock and that's a good thing. So you, technically you're not fasting, but you know, you're getting that, that on switch at 7am or 8am, which like I said, it, it's a good thing. So, um, that's, that's kind of my, how I kind of see it. It's like, yeah, you're, so, so you're not getting the benefits of the extended fast, but really between a, a 12 hour fast and a 16 hour fast, there's, there's not that much drastic different stuff, different things happening other than the calorie reduction. Um, so if you were doing a, um, I don't know, a 24 hour fast or a, a 36 hour fast, maybe then, um, you could argue some benefit to not doing coffee because, you know, I mean, it's cause, cause you're keeping it in the, typically your liver is like not doing any, any work in that sense. Um, but yeah, on a daily basis, I, I, I guess I think coffee is a good thing just from that standpoint. It is setting the clock and breaking the fast. Okay, great. And then how about, uh, how about bone broth for some people? Because some people find that they, um, benefit from getting a little bit of salt in, um, some stuff like that while they are fasting. So what are your thoughts on bone broth? Yeah. I mean, it, bone broth is amazing. And I, I think kind of the same thing as coffee in a sense that it's, it's giving you good nutrients. It's giving you the electrolytes, um, probably helping your gut a little bit and it's turning on your clock. So it's, it's doing a, it's kind of like a, a, a ninja in your, your past. So it's like <laughs> you're getting more benefit than you even are intending to because it is turning on your clock. So I think that would be a good thing. Cause yeah, it, it, it's hard to kind of separate then the clock starting and, and some of the benefits of, of restriction. So there's a lot to be learned in there. I'm sure I know there's a lot of people that know more about it than I do, but I think there's still a lot that research needs to know in general. Right, man. Yeah, that's awesome. And so for folks that don't like their coffee black necessarily, do you, um, do you try and steer people towards that? Or do you mind if people have maybe a little bit of cream in there? I know bullet, bulletproof coffee is a, is a pretty big thing right now. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the most common questions people ask about that. You know, honestly, if, if someone wants to feel, if I'm working with someone in, on a one-on-one basis and they want to feel better and lose, if they're trying to lose weight or they're improving their energy, I, I pretty much make them try to eat breakfast. So if someone's asking like to, to your question, I, I don't care if someone puts cream in there because again, I, I think it's, it's, um, if you're turning on the clock and that's a good thing. So it's almost like breakfast. I'd rather than eat a real breakfast. Um, bulletproof coffee in general, I, I usually say, you know, I, I think it's, um, I know some people feel really good on it and do really well. So at the same time, I think there's a lot of people that don't do well with it. I have seen people, some people's like lipid values go off the charts bad. Um, so I kind of, I guess I'm a little like, it's, if, if I'm, if you're paying me and I'm taking responsibility for your, for your immediate health outcomes, then you're going to eat breakfast with protein for the most part. I mean, I, I'm not like an iron fist with it, but if, if this is our problem and I want to help you improve your energy and your body clock and, and your weight loss, then at least for a month or so, I, I need to, like, I would get people to try it. And, and so most of the time people feel better. Um, and so I kind of, I guess I don't have to kind of answer that black coffee or cream coffee question. Gotcha. Cool, man. Yeah. So in sometimes people will tell like, oh, okay, fasting is different for men than it is for women. Um, can you kind of parse that out a little bit for us? Yeah. Um, I, I think, I don't know if anyone can really in depthly parse that out, but as I mentioned with the five two, I think women tend to do better with these smaller meals, and men to do be- tend to do better if they're going to take five hundred calories, just um, you know having it at dinner or skipping till dinner. Um, though, with that being said, I have seen you know the opposite in both ways. So I don't know. It's it's um it's it's interesting, and and we I think it's kind of mostly observational at this point, and I'm not sure. I guess I can't, I can't really give you a good answer other than what I've observed. And, and that's that I, I think it can work for women, but like I said, the five, two is probably a better approach. I guess I will say that from, for anecdotally than a, a limited eating window because that extended fast for women, I don't want to say it's not as good, but it seems to not be, I guess, I guess I will say it doesn't seem to be as good as this five, two approach if it's for weight loss. Um, yeah. Okay. And like so when I get women doing that, um, presuming they, they can plan accordingly of like knowing, okay, here's the foods I'm going to eat and not like leave it to the last minute. Then it, it tends to work really well. Most people can, can handle it really well. Right. Okay. Very cool. So knowing what you know, I think it's going to be really helpful for folks to hear how you structure your eating and what you eat on a daily basis. I know that you train a lot. Um, so 
things might vary through the season and where you're at, but um, what does sort of a, a typical day look like for you eating wise? Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it depends a little bit on the time, but usually I, I'll eat, I'll always eat breakfast. Um, either a smoothie with just like mixed berries and, um, avocado and three eggs and I use whey protein and collagen protein and creatine. That's kind of one of my staples. Sometimes I'll have that for lunch because it, it can take it with me nicely or I'll have it as my breakfast. Um, alternate breakfast would be like, like this morning I had, uh, I don't know, I have some eggs and, uh, um, what did I have with the eggs, eggs and some rice, little, little soy sauce and, and sometimes some ground beef with that. Um, so it's so always something with protein in the morning. I definitely like drink my own Kool-Aid when it comes to that. <laughs> nice. uh, uh, and then, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, you know, I, I make generally good food choices. I eat a ton of dates as my snacks and, and almond butter, uh, but generally I mean, try to eat three meals with protein and sometimes snacks, sometimes don't. And, and, and then try to stop eating by, you know, a reasonable time. Um, again, in the summer, I, I let that be a little bit more, give myself more latitude. And in the winter I try you know, to eat around five thirty six, um, you know, when possible. Sometimes, if if it's um, if I'm not gonna be able to eat till seven thirty eight or eight thirty, I'll try to just eat earlier, like four thirty five. Or it, it kind of depends on, on where I'm at, but I make an effort to do that. And you know, it's um, it's uh, I have amazing uh, cooking from my wife and my mother in law. So oh, there you uh, go. Yeah. So <laughs> I've got it pretty good in that in that sense. You know? Sounds like it. So this is just a, a selfish question on my part, but how do you fuel uh, while you're on the bike? So are you doing? Are you taking? You mentioned dates. Do you take those with you? Are you doing something like bananas, or what are you doing on the bike? Yeah, good question. I, I actually wouldn't do dates or bananas. Um, the, the things that um, we want to avoid high fiber foods for for GI distress reasons. I mean, if I'm going out just for a, something short or mellow, I might bring something like that. But generally, like if we're talking about a long ride, let's say longer than longer than two and a half hours, and maybe with some intensity, some hills and stuff like that, I would um, sport a sports drink, a, a certain sports drinks. I like scratch. Um, during Ironman, actually, I would do jam and salt sandwiches on white bread, um, and and a mix of those and like Cliff shot blocks or gels. Uh, basically. The foods that are good during exercise are usually the opposite of foods that are good during normal life and vice versa. So people want to take like a cliff bar or, or something like a, um, a banana. Even banana is, is mostly potassium and almost no sodium. When in, we kind of want the opposite, we want mostly sodium uh, as far as our electrolytes go. And, and protein, fat, and fiber are all good things during normal life. They slow down glucose absorption and all these things. This is the exact opposite we want during exercise. So we want no pro- we want as quick as absorption of carbohydrate as we can so things without any fiber so like i said white bread and jam works well um a mix of carbohydrates and like i said no no protein um yeah no no fat so when people are trying to do like almond butter on a bike ride which gets recommended some by surprisingly a lot of people uh it just it doesn't make any sense we don't need fat when we're riding we need carbohydrate and, and again a quickly absorbable one yeah, and I love that you mentioned that, that it's the exact opposite of what you want to do. Like if weight loss is your goal, you don't want to be drinking sports drinks. You don't want to be having, uh, what was it, jam and, and salt sandwiches? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, if weight loss is your goal, but, but you're doing training for an Ironman, then I would just put that only during the training window. Because then it's like it's like putting logs on a fire. You're, you're burning 80% of the carbs you've taken are just going right to your muscles and being burned. Um, but when you're sitting at your desk, that's a terrible idea. Right. So. Yeah. So you want to util- utilize that fuel quickly. That's awesome, man. So I interviewed Stefan Guillenet for the podcast and he contributed to the ideal weight program on human OS and you do the fasting portion on human OS that I highly recommend you guys check out. It's a step-by-step visual learning course around fasting with short questions. So you retain the info and then really cool implementation strategies throughout the whole thing. So I'm going to link to that in the show notes, but can you tell folks a little bit more about where they can find out more about you, your coaching services, and then follow you on social media? Uh, sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. The, the, uh, the course I created with Dan party is really meant to just give a, a, a a solid um, overview of fasting, you know, similar to what we talked about today, but it goes in a little bit more detail to some of the mechanisms and some of the more specifics. Um, that's at, at Human OS. My website is eatsleep.fit. Um, you can go there and see, you can get a link to that fasting course as well, and, and just see what I'm up to, um, who I work with, and the kind of things that I do. Um, 
social media. I'm, I'm on Instagram and Twitter um, and Facebook, so feel free to reach out there. Um, but yeah, the, the website is probably the main hub of, of what I share with what I do. Uh, so yeah. Awesome, man. So I'll link up to all that stuff in the show notes. And Jeff, just thanks so much for coming on the podcast and sharing all this info with us. And I'd I'd love to have you on in the future for you who are open to it to talk more about the timing and the circadian rhythm around food. I think you're super knowledgeable on that. So that'd be cool, man. I would love that. I appreciate you having me. Awesome. Thanks so much. Hey guys, so thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I hope you guys got a lot out of listening to Jeff talk about fasting. Just to recap, Fasting has been around for ages. So Jeff and I touched on how our physiology actually expects it from us. So I'd highly recommend that people implement at least, say, 12 hours if possible. So going from, say, if they eat dinner at 7 at night until 7 in the morning, that would be a cool uh, sort of window to have. And then if you want to extend that window, you can always try that. Um, There are tons of different ways to do it, which we touched on in the episode. But If you're a man or a woman, um, it's not necessarily that fasting always works better for men, but there are different approaches for different people. And Jeff mentioned that there are tendencies that he sees that it works better for women with. I have found success with extending the window in the morning. So basically eating dinner at night and then pushing back breakfast. I find that just in general for most folks that is the easiest to do however by no means do you have to do it that way there's tons of different ways to do it Um, find what works for you but again the take-home point our physiology actually expects us to go to go extended periods of time without food so being chronically fed all the time is not a good thing and then obviously overeating is not a good thing uh, just from a health standpoint and obviously from a weight standpoint which you know dovetails into the health so hope you guys enjoyed the podcast if you got a bunch out of it um, it really helps me and the podcast grow if you review the, the podcast on iTunes and so we can get more of this awesome information out to people and just help more and more people with their health and uh yeah throw it up on social media if you'd like to and yeah again guys thanks so much for listening i hope you got a bunch out of it see ya